Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, everyone. My name is Peter Adler. I'm a planner, a mediator, an arbitrator, and I'm also a member of Think Tech's board of directors. And for the last several months, I've been on a walkabout doing a reconnaissance on one of the biggest issues coming up for all of us on November 6th. I haven't decided which way I will vote, and I'm not going to ask our guests that either, but I'm committed to understanding the question and making a reasoned decision, and I'll do that on November 5th. This special three-part think tech series is called Hawaii's Big Choice, Should We Have a New Constitutional Convention? That question, along with a second one regarding a special property tax to fund education, will be on the ballot when we vote. Um, today's series deals with the first question, which is, should there be a constitutional convention? And we've had three of those to date. The first one was in 1959, when we became a state. The second one was in 1968. And the third was in 1978. 68 and 78 produced important amendments and revisions to the Constitution, especially 78. Since then, 40 years have gone by, and we haven't revisited the Constitution. Should we? Is it time? If CONCONs are a mirror of the times and reflect the issues of the day, are there challenges and problems that a constitutional convention should take up? That is what you will decide when you cast your ballot on November 6th. In these three half-hour segments, we are looking at different aspects of all this. In the first one, my friends Avi Seufer and Rebecca Soon gave you a better understanding of what is at stake and how a CONCON works mechanically. In the second one, Colin Moore, Kitty Yanone, and I uh, inventoried some of the proposals that would likely come on the table if voters approve one on November 6th. And in this third one, I want to try to confront and name some of the bright hopes and dark fears that are embedded in the whole question. The CONCON issue is not simple and has many different faces and nuances and textures. In fact, it's a little like the proverbial blind men trying to figure out what an elephant is. If there is one big uber message to all of these discussions, it's this. Let's get informed about what kind of elephant we are dealing with. Think about the big yes or no choice. And above all, get out and vote one way or the other. More on that a little later. Meanwhile, to get us started, I've invited two friends and colleagues here to help think it through. Neil Milner is a retired professor of political science from the University of Hawaii, an election night commentator, and a regular columnist for Honolulu Civil Beat. And he's also a theater buff and a drama writer and so on, does a lot of things. Brendan Lee is the former chair of the 2016 Native Hawaiian Constitutional Convention and past president of the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs, a very vulnerable organization. And he's a candidate for trustee at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. So let me start a question, field a question to both of you. And the question is, what are we hearing? We're a little just over a month out. Um, what are we hearing? Are people alert to this issue? Are they paying attention to it? Uh, what, what, what's the buzz on the street, um, if any? First, a couple real quick things. The first constitutional convention for the state was in 1950, not 59. Yeah. Um, and I was never the president of the association yet. What? I was, I'm, the sec I'm the sitting second vice president. Uh, um, I don't want people to go, wow, he's just promoting himself. He's an important person. Um, we can have a vote right here. We can have a vote right <laughs> we can here. Vote now. <laughs> um, but I, would, um, I am hearing chatter out there um, in circles that I, that I move around in. Um, when I deal with the general public, no one really seems to be talking or even know anything about the Con Con. But in, um, Circles that have influence and have a vested interest in a con, con they absolutely are talking. There's a very great buzz amongst them. We'll come back to that. Neil, what are you hearing? I'm not hearing very much. I think there's two kind of meta reasons why you're not hearing very much that go beyond this issue. One of which is that um, state and local politics is much less important than it used to be. There's all kinds of studies on that that show it. People don't have, they have less knowledge and they have less interest. Second, and related to that, reinforcing it is the obsession with national politics and especially with Trump and Washington. And my group that I see around, my part of the public that I see who tend to be pretty interested in politics um, are totally wrapped up in that sort of thing. In totally the national wrapped, scene. In the national scene, in the Trump scene, and there doesn't even seem to be any room for it. Now remember, this is a fairly astute, these are not people who are apathetic or don't follow politics. But it's just, they don't have room for it. It's just not there. Now, maybe they'll have room 
if we begin to talk about it more, because it's pretty early in the game. Uh, but right now, nothing. So it's October 1 that we're filming this and talking about this, and the, no, the election's November 6th. So that means there's a month uh, and six days, uh, 37 days to run up. What can we expect in terms of mobilization? Will we see a rise in people paying attention to this? Who's talking about it? What will, who will mobilize around this issue, one way or another? Well, I think that the, you, you mentioned it before, Brendan, that part of who will mobilize it are people who are organized for prior things and have a very clear West vested interest which is one of the troublesome dynamics of this that we can come back to later if you worry about wor worst fears. The rest of it is not really, the, it's, it's really not that clear to me what will happen when you try to mobilize the other groups. Who's going to do it? Um, if people are attentive to newspapers, if people are attentive to those kinds of things, then they'll begin to pick up stuff like that. I'm not sure. I'm not just, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm really not sure the way politics works in Hawaii right now and the lack of interest in certain things, what the mechanisms are for, for doing these things. I mean, you know, word of mouth can do a lot of things. Word of mouth really got David Ige to beat Neil Abercrombie in the primary. There was a lot of intensity there. But I don't know. I'm really puzzled about what it'll be. And I would agree about the being puzzled. You know. Um, November 6th is a month away, but October 13th is 12 days away, and that's when the absentee ballots drop. Yeah. And historically, our state likes to vote absentee. Mm -hmm. So this decision might be made a lot sooner than November 6th, although we won't know the results of that until November 6th. Um, mobilization has started already. Like I said, you know, I've heard buzz around, great buzz in, the, in those circles that are, have vested interests. I've attended three union meetings already that they're talking with their membership about a con con. Um, the Association of Hawaiian Civic Clubs has had many meetings already about um, the repercussions of a constitutional convention. Um, I know OHA sent out uh, an online survey through email to their um, server list about that because I received it. Um, we don't have results yet though, right? No, I, I haven't seen any results, but the, but the talk is there and the actions and excitement around this issue is growing. Um, as we sit here and shoot, the, um, shoot this episode, I know that there was another, um, the Women's Voter League had, an, had an, um, a forum on this on the Hawaii Island. Um, there's another event this evening that I'm going to attend right after this at UH Law School about and the Colin was mentioning mm -hmm. some of that. Right. So, you know, momentum is picking up just for the convert. There's much more conversations now starting to happen about this issue. So would it be fair to say that the, those who are opposed, whether it be unions or business groups and so on, will be much more organized than those who are in favor? In other words, if there's, I, I haven't heard groups coalescing around. Let's, that's let's that's been the one. pattern in the past, I think. And that, you think that'll hold true again? I think it'll hold true again because it's just easier, because it's not that they're opposed, it's the fact that they have mechanisms there. You're talking about labor unions, right? I think the interesting, it may be small, but an inter, a possibly significant group here is whether the kind of progressives in the state, the left wing, let's say, of the Democratic Party, organize in any way in opposition, because there have been two pretty influential uh, progressive politicians who have come out against uh, against Con Con. And, um, they, you know, they're, they both run for office. They're both well-known. They're both very articulate. And there has been this kind of movement that emerged after the Sanders election. They're, they're floating around out there. They're not necessarily that visible, but I wonder if something is going to happen with that, and if they coalesce with some other groups, say some environmental groups, who get really worried about things. Did you, would you think, and question, would you think that the fact that the primary election was very important in terms of future determinations, that people are going to go, this was all a done deal, why should I vote? I mean, is there some risk to that? Is there a risk around that? Ab absolutely. Um, you know, as you stated in my introduction that I'm running for, for an office, that's a big fear for us because typically we, we live, not typically, but we live in a Democratic versus a Republican state. And typically, when big races, a Democrat wins that big race in the primary, the majority of the public here in the state assume, oh, then this, this race is decided. There's no point in me voting in the general election. So the fear is that the voter turnout for the general is going to be 
even lower than it was for the primary. And we all know how abysmal those numbers were. And they've been declining yeah, historically. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the voter turnout uh, could be a big factor in this people's general uh, ignorance apathy. about the apathy mm -hmm. and ignorance about the issues. People say it's already done deal, why should I vote, and so on. So those are going to be factors on this. Um, the, do you think there's there anything that would change that game between now and November 6th that would uh, kind of press the button and push more voters to pay attention to this? I do. What, what would that be? Money. I think if um, some of the national PACs that have a tendency to pump hundreds of millions of dollars into an individual issue started showing up in Hawaii, that people between would, now and November, between now and yeah, November, that's interesting. People would take notice. That's what happened on Maui with the GMO. That, absolutely, and that's one of the things that the left worries about, and with re, with good reason. You know the. Koch brothers, that very well-financed and ex extremely sophisticated national organization, has gotten very much involved in referendum, in, in kind of, this is not a referendum in quite the same way, I mean, ultimately, CONCON. They, they're very anti-public trans transit, and they've been very successful in Nashville and in other places organizing to defeat referendum. So, and that's different from 1978. I mean, 1978 had a lot of political dynamics and a lot of passion, but you didn't have the PACs, you didn't have the Koch brothers, you didn't have that same kind of big money. I don't know, what are the carpenters going to do? I mean, if they tossed almost a million dollars in the direction of Josh Green, uh, you know, are, do they have, they, they certainly can see themselves having a stake in this. But I don't know what they we haven't heard anything about that. So far. Yet. So far. So far, right. right. Yeah. Sure. And would the carpenters be able to monetarily compete against the Koch brothers? Yeah. No. Are the Koch brothers, let me make sure I understood yeah. that, are the Koch brothers their anti-initiative referendum recall? No. They're, they're I don't know if they're that. What they are is they're anti, they're anti, well, they're anti lots of things and pro <laughs> lots of things. But in this case that I've been paying some attention to, they're anti-public, all public transit. They, yeah. they're, okay. And, and they want so, to just see it privatized. Right. They want to see Whatever. It, yeah. yeah. And they also are in the oil business. So, I mean, cars can make them a lot of money. So that in, in places they pushed, uh, they've, they've fought against referenda that would give money for public transit, for mass transit in, in Nashville. So here they may be less interested in stopping the concon the con -con from going, but they may be, and, 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 and it may be the same with some of these others. They'll figure that's not a big deal, but if it does pass, we'll put a lot of money into certain things. So let me just make sure I got it. So the appearance, the public appearance of a fair amount of mainland money or PAC money or super PAC money could suddenly rise the tide of interest in this, as it seemed to do on Maui with the you know, GMO and the pesticide issues over there. I think so. Sure. Yeah. And the, the, um, since we were talking, you were talking earlier about greatest fears and greatest aspirations, the greatest fear with, with that super PAC money comes a ton of misinformation where it could make one side or the other look much more favorable or not so favorable than it actually is. And thus far, we haven't seen no, any of that. Not we yet. We don't see any real signs no. popping up or jumping up. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm beginning to wonder, because those campaigns are, the, actually, the Carpenters did better in the Caldwell campaign than they did in, uh, in this one in terms of sophistication. But those are kind of long term. They do a lot of prep for them. They do a lot of surveys for them. And I don't know if that's happening. Um, they're, and they don't usually talk about it very much. But it may be that this is just too small potatoes for that kind of stuff to get in. And or we're too deep blue. Or too deep, well, or else they'll stick the money in if it turns out that it passes and there's a chance for them to get something or for them to stop something. So we're going we're gonna to go to a break in just a minute. But one more quick question. If there was to be, mo we've talked about who might mobilize for, and that's where the big money comes, starts to come in. Is there anybody out there who would mobilize uh, against? Absolutely. And who will that the be? The big money might. Who, who will that be? No, you, if, we, if we said, I'm, I'm yeah. not being clear, if we said there might be big money coming in mm -hmm. from the mainland that says, let's have one of these. We love it. It's good for your state, good for America. Who would mobilize against? Is it, the, is it the same groups we've been talking about? The yeah, unions, all the, the business unions. roundtables, yeah. those kind of guys. Absolutely, yeah, unions, unions, unions for sure. Yeah, yeah. that always. Uh, you know, unions for sure. Um, they have a lot to lose. Yeah, yeah um, the 
Native, Native Hawaiian organizations, obviously, you know, um, environment. I, I think the environmental lobby would, yeah, the national would, yes, environmental lobby definitely would get hugely Look, involved. Look, there's a kind of interesting way to think about unconventional politics. And this is an uncon that is, it's not the day-to-day -day stuff. If you have good access into the conventional political system, which certainly unions do, um, and lots of others, and maybe now even the environmental organizations, then you're less interested and more frightened of unconventional ways. Political protests, for example. People protest, yeah, sure, there's passion there, but it's because they don't have any other access in. And so in, in a situation like this, one of the things, you know, one of the dynamics is there are things we want to get. We don't like the way the legislature does it. It's not transparent. It's slow. It's you know, to corporate interests, and so we'll go somewhere else and try, which is exactly why those people who do get access, like the unions and so on, don't want to get involved in this kind of hustle and bustle of unconventional politics. We're going to pick this up in a minute. We're going to a break, and we'll keep talking on it. Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Welcome back. Um, so we were just talking in the break about uh, the legislature actually could do a lot of the things that might pop out in proposals. Uh, and in fact, one of the ideas of a con-con seems to be that you convene citizens because they can override things in, when the legislature doesn't do things. That seemed, in 78, there were a lot of issues that came out you know, from 78 that legislature could have done previously. So that seems to be one of the functions and the others that it launches new careers and new political wins and political generations. Well, what was interesting about the 1978 CONCON, con, um, just for transparency, I was in third grade when this happened. Um, you, but you didn't vote, huh? <laughs> I didn't vote. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that the legislature did, legislature did not expect to happen was every single mm -hmm. thing that came out of the CONCON con <clears throat> passed. The legislature did not expect that to happen. Yeah. Um, they, they fully believe that, oh, some of this stuff's just not going to go through, and, or we'll be able to control. And to some extent, some of the things they were able to control, like some of the wording was changed a little bit. And so, you know, those that are entrenched will always find a way to remain entrenched. So one of the theories uh, that's been floating around is that constitutional conventions, it, when they come about, tend to be a mirror of the times, the temper of the public mood. And 78 was a good example of that. The war in Vietnam, lots of environmental issues, Native Hawaiian issues, plenty of things running. Um, what's the temper of the times now that uh, you know, either leads to one or doesn't lead to one or makes it you know, probable or improbable? What, what do we, it, it, the question is, what's, the, what's, in, well, what's in the public's mind? A word of caution before I, I take a chance at the answer. The word of caution is that I, I don't know how much in retrospect we saw the temper of the times and how much yeah. what was actually happening every day in the, in the convention, in, in CONCON. CONCON to me in 78 seemed really pretty amazing. You had, you had a strong leader who kind of emerged, Bill Patey, who knew how to put coalitions together and the Hawaiian issues emerged and so on. And I the graduates know. of the law school. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that's right. Um, in fact, you had it in order to get into the law school. But the, I don't know if there is a temper of the times right now that's relevant to CONCON -Con in the way that we now see the temper of the times relevant there. You know, when you say the war in Vietnam, that got filtered through an increased interest in community organizing, grassroots participation, political protest. Kalama Valley, you know, was certainly yeah. an example of that. Great example. Yeah, I don't know if there's, I don't think there's anything like that now. I don't think the temper of the times is what's happening in Washington, um, how much we don't like the other side, 
and kind of tribal tribal very yeah tribal. And, and the very important issues that should be dealt with here I'm not sure people pay enough attention to that well I actually think that's the temperament that we had that is here in the state right now you know they're looking at the national what's going on, on the national level and how all of these protections that have come about over the last 10 years are all being stripped away yeah. with a stroke of a pen they were hard-fought things that took decades to get in place that are being stripped away literally with the stroke of a pen which is why I think that temper now is fear. Everyone is afraid of, mm -hmm. if we open this up. It will get crazy. What, mm -hmm. will, what can get taken away with us at the snap of a finger that were hard fought to get in 1978? Well, so what, about the, what about the opposite side of the coin, that we see that as um, a continuing effort that started here, and particularly in other states that have more uh, power, like California, uh, the strategies that you have to use, assuming that the national government is gonna do bad things to you, the kind of counter thrust that you can do, and whether people want to use the constitutional convention to create protections, to create from protections. The national yeah, yeah, that's right, from yeah. the national stuff. And yeah. if the and if the general public was a much more educated public, I would completely agree with that. Yeah. But yeah. as we both said earlier, the apathy with voting, the non-interest in local politics, doesn't lend itself to that. It plus, yeah, plus a lot of these changes are these incredibly important changes and steps back are done in the kind of rulemaking administrative level the sort of uh, bread and butter things that most people don't pay attention to and it's extraordinarily important uh, so the temper of the times is there's no temper of the times yeah, or it's, not it's much. a different it's a it's a different, different era it's a different era yeah. so let's say i want to go to one of the heart of the things i wanted to get your thoughts on today so let's imagine we had a group of people in here that were um really in favor of a con con what would be their highest hopes what would be the things they would what would we be hearing from advocates in favor of having a con con fix the legislature you know much more transparency within the legislature structural changes structural mm -hmm. changes um the sunshine law that was written in, in 1978 was meant to be have transparency and then once that passed what the legislature did was just said okay well we're going to exempt ourselves from that mm -hmm. Right? A con con could strip that right away from them to exempt themselves. And then now everybody, everybody has to abide so by the people would get be, if they were If we had a group of pros, in yeah. Here, yeah. we'd say they're mad about the, the way government locally functions and there's some polling that seems to reflect yeah. that. And people would want to find fixes and, you know, trying to create a game change. On ways that. to streamline the legislature, um, ways to make it much more transparent. You know, get that would be a, got replaced, get rid of conference committee. Absolutely. And, um, mm -hmm. put, in place, um, put in place term limits for the legislature. So if, you're, if you decide to run and you want to step forward and serve, you know that you're on a clock. So I have an interest in getting my work done mm -hmm. because my time is limited on which I can affect change. I think there's another thing that would drive a lot of people, and it's... Um, I mean, I can spend a lot of time being critical of it, but it's really powerful and it's very emotional. And that is giving the power back to the people. The phrase that this gives the power back to the people as, I don't know what you want to say, historically overblown that idea is, never mind, it's a powerful myth in American society and you believe that this, this is a way to return to a form of popular democracy that lets those of us most affected by it have a role in it. Um, and they say we've been cut out. And we've been cut out. That, that, that's right. That essentially, a, the more you have this kind of thing, the more you're reflecting a true kind of democracy. What about the other side? Let's imagine we had a whole group of people in here who said, no way, we don't want one. What are their worst fears? We've talked a little bit about some of those. Yeah, we don't have enough time. Well, we'll <laughs> let's get to a few of the ones that rise to the top um, of the list. Well, the, uh, for myself as a native Hawaiian, the first thing that comes to mind is the um, repeal of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, repealing Native Hawaiian gathering rights, repealing Native Hawaiian Olelo Hawaii as an official language of the state. You know, all pretty much any um, minority rights, period, getting getting retracted throughout. So that'd be a particular issue for all the Native Hawaiians who've been paying attention to Native Hawaiian issues. We know there's some that are not. But many have been, and that's been building for the last 25, 30 years. Absolutely. You know, um, Native Hawaiians take it for granted that, you know, I have the right to go into um, the ocean to collect things for sustenance when 
even though it says that there's no gathering in this particular area, that could be stripped away. And uh, we don't care that your ancestors have been living on this plot of land for the last 2,000 years. You have no rights, because the law says you can't go. So it's a loss. I mean, there's loss. From fear of loss is, an, is one of the drivers. And that would be true with environmental groups and Absolutely. some of the unions who enjoy collective bargaining. Right. Well, well, I, I, think that's, I think that's generally the driver. It's a fear of losing something that you have now that might disappear by, in, by accepting a totally, at this stage, unknown and uncontrollable process at this stage. So you have to decide if, if a person sees stuff that he or she would like to get, and also sees things that would, you know, the, there might be Hawaiian groups or whatever that are interested in making the legislature more transparent, hard as that is to believe. Um, but at the same time, so there are choices that are, are going to be made here. But the, the kind of progressive opposition uh, to, and in some ways, Tom Kaufman's opposition to having a con con is based on those two things. You're going to lose some really good stuff. The Constitution is fundamentally good. Don't take a chance by letting the, you know, letting the enemies come in and destroy what you've already had. So one scenario on November 6th, or on the 7th, when all the votes are in and they've been counted at midnight, when you're still there talking about it, <laughs> um, what, one, one scenario is that to an audience it's all, two, yeah. it didn't pass, it died, that's the end of it, and it goes back on the 10-year clock, and you know, 10 years again from now, there'll be another chance for the citizens to vote or the legislature can put ballots on their ballot initiatives or call one if they choose. The other scenario is that it passes. And if it passes, talk to me a little bit about what you think the delegate mix would be in any election of delegates. Wow. Who would roll out? Because that's another piece of this. I, I don't know that we can answer that at this time. Because that, um, like we were saying, well, like you were saying earlier, if it passes, who's who out there is going to take interest you know, the Koch brothers maybe don't have any interest in this right now. Then all of a sudden it passes and we're going to have a con, con Now all of a sudden their eyes are looking at Hawaii going, hey, they're going to have a con, con We can pump some money in and get some people that we can control in as delegates and let's strip away some land rights so that we can develop wherever we want. So fears of that dark money are yeah. one of the drivers. We only got a minute left and I'd love to hear from each of you if you had one comment you'd like to make to anybody who might be listening to this. Uh, what would it be? What would you like to tell people about this? Get educated. Um, learn about what a con con means. Um, learn what's important. Figure out for yourself what's important to you and what you want to preserve for you, yourself, and your family and the generations to come past you. And then have that help you drive your decision of whether you want to support or not support a constitutional convention. I would say listen to both sides. And what I mean by that is that so much of regular politics here is, is through uh, partisan filters. In this case, the partisan filters aren't there. And, you know, it might be an advantage that people don't know very much about this and don't have preconceived notions. Make that work for you. Actually, for once, be a kind of citizen that we're always looking for but seldom find, which is a person who can sit back, look at both sides, and then make a decision. There are strong arguments on both sides. You can figure those out for yourself. You're not going to have a certain answer, but do that. So that's also my uh, kind of closing comment is uh, my, my counsel is pick an issue that you are worried about and you want to protect or an issue that you want to advocate for and see change. And either way, get out and vote and think those issues through. Think those issues through. Brendan, Neil, thank you so much for joining sure. us. Thanks, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.